This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. I am Gora, Albania. Oh, when you come to New York? Oof. <laughs> Thursday. Man is absolutely crazy. We're here to pray. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. And I'm Gil Adler. Today, our guest is a uh, is a character actor, an international character actor named Mark Ivanir. And uh, you might not know his name, but most people who, who go to film, TVs, who play video games, you'll see his face, you'll hear his voice, and you'll, as you do with a lot of character actors, you'll go, that guy. Mark is that guy. I know Mark socially. Uh, but the world, I think certainly the, the American audience knows Mark, I think, a lot. Uh, Homeland as Ivan uh, on the show Barry. You, you're really funny in Barry, the, the, the <laughs> twins. Were they twins or twi- triplets? Uh, well, the, the, the third brother who dies. Who yeah, right. Yeah. So, is, it's, it's, it's three brothers. He, he dies in the pilot, and I joined uh, episode two. So okay. let's say twins. Okay. All right. Twins, twins. I think a lot of people know you from there. Of course, you've got a ton of feature film work. We'll, we'll get to all that. If you play video games, you know Mark's work. Good God. you've uh, Have you been in virtually every single uh, Call of Duty? Going dog. A lot of Call of Duty. A ton yeah. of Call of Duty and, and uh, some Assassin's Creed and Wolfenstein. Oh, we'll get to all of that. But the world knows Mark that way. Gil has never met Mark before. As I said, I, I've i had the, the pleasure of knowing Mark socially for God, a long time now. 15 uh, years, maybe. 15 even years, more. yeah, yeah, yeah. My goal today is to let the whole world know the, the Mark I know. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mark, I, I, I'm a little upset because uh, having known Alan for 15 years, um, I, I suspect, you know, my y- y- your judgment of character isn't as good as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's well, got their flaws. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm not I'm, I'm going to keep silent until yeah. <laughs> you guys figure out your stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you you started your life in uh, where well, you were born in uh, Chernitsi which was formerly the Soviet Union, now the Ukraine, which makes you incredibly topical. I, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, for many, many years, I've been introduced and introducing myself as Russian because that's my first language. And in Israel, in which I grew up, I was not Ukrainian because there's no such a thing. You, he's a Ukrainian. You're like generally Russian if you come from the USSR. Sure. But then, yes, in the last year, exactly, that's, that distinction is really important now to say, no, I'm not Russian, I'm Ukrainian. And uh, uh, yeah, it's very, very sad what's happening there, though it's, it's a bit of a, it's, hap- it's happening everywhere now. The world is a, is a bit of a scary place with what's going on. Well, go, go Ukraine. Their, their, their struggle is our struggle. Yeah. Yeah, no, you, definitely. Now, you, you left, well, it was the Soviet Union then when you were, what, seven years old? I was about, yeah, about seven. My parents decided to go leave for, I mean, it was the 70s, the whole uh, let my people go movement, mm-hmm. and this, but, there was a window of opportunity. But you have distinct memories of living in the Soviet Union, a thing which oh, no longer definitely. exists. Yeah. Definitely, that was that was my childhood, and and, and I kind of liked it. It was it was nice for me in that city. We didn't feel uh, as Jews. We didn't feel too much anti-Semitism, especially as as a kid. And um, um, it was it was a nice way of to grow up. 
And then, uh, but then my parents decided because I have a big mouth, they didn't tell me we're going to Israel because there wasn't like a good thing for everyone to know. And they told me we're going to go to Moscow. And uh, of course, like 20 minutes later, I was downstairs at the yard telling everyone we're going to Moscow that they took, though they told me not to speak about it. But basically after 48 hours of travel on the way to Israel, which I didn't know that's where we're going, uh, by, uh, I think, the Czech Republic, they just told me, we were on the train, and they told me we are actually going to Israel and not to Moscow. And that was such a traumatic experience. I, I remember sitting there. I, I really remember that that train, uh, I don't know, where we were sitting and and I was crying my eyes out. I, I I was so scared because all I knew about Israel was this is a place where, you know, there's wars and soldiers and uh, there was that wasn't easy. But then I came to Israel and uh, that became that's my central identity. I guess is Israeli more than anything else because I spent there between what, the age of seven and 34, that's 27 years, that's a lot. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. You settled in, you, as you said, you, you, this became your mantle. And because you were Israeli, you had to do military service. Mm -hmm. And your military service was, was kind of interesting because you ended up in, in an intelligence unit of the IDF. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's, it, it's funny how Back then, it was an extremely uh, secretive, clandestine unit. No one, you know, I, you, you would talk on the phone with, with, with someone and you couldn't pronounce the name of the unit. That was, I mean, if anyone, if you heard your friend saying that, you would be, ah! yeah. and then now in the past 10 years, as soon as Israel became this empire of high tech, uh, and it was kind of moved by this unit, which was very instrumental in creating a lot of people who got into high tech and became very successful. So now suddenly, I, I remember like five, six years ago, I started seeing the name of the unit, which is 8200 in the newspapers. And I was each time in the beginning, I was so stressed. I was like, how is it possible they do yeah. that? So now it's like the go-to play. Everyone wants to get there because, you know, that's the path to become to, to a unicorn. But back then it was really interesting. And, and, and for my career, it was helpful because, because I'm playing a lot of spies and uh, international, I, I don't know, figures. And, and that was, I was part of, incredible hindsight uh, operations. I was like, one day I get a phone call from a director who says, so we offered you this job on uh, this movie called the Red Sea Diving Resort about mm -hmm. how the Mossad... We, we, we will come to that because that, that if, had you not really, the, the, the connection between your role in that movie and your role yeah. in your life is really, that's a very cool story. So... Should I tell the story now or should we wait? No, no, no. This is exactly right. But I wanted to make sure that we understood that, that you, your, your art and your life intertwined in such an unusual fashion that... Uh, yeah. Now, so guy... but let, let, me, let, me, let me start here. Yeah. As part of your, your service, when you were working for, was it, it was a unit 880, eight, uh, what was it called again? 8200. 8200. 8200. Okay, you were involved in Operation Joshua. Yeah, well, and it's called. It was actually it was called Operation Moses. They had phases, but yeah, right. And this was part of a of a large, a large operation. This was kind of the the um, a mop up to a, a previous operation to try to get as many of the Ethiopian uh, Beit Israel Jews out of. Uh, well, they, a lot of them had gotten into into Sudan at that point to get them out. It was possible. Ethiopia was war torn, and, mm -hmm. and especially the the 
these Ethiopian Jews were persecuted and and murdered and etc. And the government of Israel at the time decided we're gonna we're gonna try and get them to Israel as as soon as possible. It started with a Mossad operation. Now, let's, uh, now but before we go there, I want to make sure that everyone understands who we who exactly we're talking about when, when we say the, these Ethiopian Jews. It's a very unusual group of people. It's they is a group of of of, of black Jews whose history dates back two thousand years. They, yeah. they really can. It's it's how they came about is still a mystery. There it's are a very- mystery. They they say they are the descendants of uh, King Solomon and the uh, Queen of Sheba. Yes. Uh, and you know, there's there's interesting research about it but basically i mean still it's it's close to israel so there was you can you can th- you can see how during the last i don't know 2000 years people went uh there and and ended up being there jewish or, or not and but but they have mm-hmm. been for hundreds and hundreds of years identifying years. In, in, in fact what, what's really interesting about them is they they practice <clears throat> a pre-rabbinic form of judaism Correct. Correct. And, and it really, which predates the destruction of the Second Temple. Yeah. No, it's it's really fascinating. And I've been, I mean, you had people, all kind, all, all sort of Jewish uh, travelers who went there 300 years ago, 400 years ago, and started uh, uh, reporting about this incredible group of people in, like, in Africa that have all of these Jewish, as you say, uh, ancient uh, traditions that they kept, and, and, and they've been very adamant about staying and being <clears throat> Jew, though it was very dangerous. Indeed. Indeed. They, uh, and in fact, there's a whole group, uh, the Falasha group, which were like conversos, yeah. they were like the Moranos in, in, uh, in Spain. Correct. Who, Correct. Who, who converted? There, the the history really, in a way, mirrored what happened in in Europe. Yeah. There were yeah. a fascinating, fascinating group of people. There are about a hundred twenty thousand of of them now in 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 Israel. Uh, yeah. Well, I know that during that operation that we're going to talk about, uh, about twenty thousand were brought. Right. to Israel, but it's been going since uh, the uh, like early 80s. Right. It was a it, it was a total secret. No one knew about it. It was it Indeed. was uh, completely clandestine. So okay. basically what happened was this guy director calls me and says, did you get the message about the part in this movie? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And maybe you can choose between these parts. And I was like, yeah, well, I, I probably would choose the head of the Mossad because it's a you know it's 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 going to take shorter time of filming because I want to be with my family and blah 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 and we have all of this conversation it's like and by the way I say I was there and he's he's <laughs> like what what, to, to what 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 do you mean <laughs> so this was it started as a the Mossad started they took a uh, abandoned diving resort. Uh, that was founded by Italians in Sudan. Now, Ethiopia is landlocked, so you couldn't get people. It was very difficult to get them out uh, from Ethiopia. So they traveled for two, three weeks by foot on the mountains, exposed to danger to Sudan, got near this uh, uh, diving resort that was operated by, by the Mossad as a diving resort by day and at night commando from israel come in the beginning in boats and get them out uh load them on boats and get them out and then next morning they would work with japanese tourists uh teaching them to dive at the end what happened they the sudanese kind of got a word of it and and that got canceled an israeli newspaper put out that this was was happening isn't that what happened? Uh, I, 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 I believe I read. Sure about, maybe I'm not sure about the details mm. how that happened, but that part went away. And then what they were doing is that still Mossad people were in the in the area. Planes would come in the middle of the night from Israel. Hercules planes groups were waiting 
I don't know, dozens, hundreds were waiting in the middle of the desert. The plane would land pitch dark in the middle of the desert and uh, load uh, these, these Ethiopian Jews on the Hercules and would go back. And that was my thing. That's I, I, I ended up being uh, on two of these uh, Hercules uh, flights coming landing in sudan running out it would take about seven minutes the whole thing you land run outside get all of these babies and old people and uh load them on the plane go back to israel and that was uh that was it but that was crazy the first time i went there i didn't know that was what what was happening i just like they gave us some sort of a short brief and then only when we were on the plane, they told us what's what's going to happen. Need to know. That's that's it. Hey, it's the spy world. Yeah, it's called the the, the Red Sea Diving Resort. Uh, the movie's right. on Netflix. Gideon Reif, who you also worked with on on, uh, on Homeland, he yeah. he he wrote and directed. He wrote and directed. The, he was well, yeah. His he has his military background as a paratrooper, so the whole thing kind of right, 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 right. After your, after you finished the service, but before you got going, you, the Mossad recruited you. I've been approached three or four or five times by them, and and most of the times I would say no. I worked for one branch for some time, uh, but I mostly I mostly said no to them because I I wanted to be an actor, and uh, and they would you know bring me. It was every two years I would get a phone call in the middle of the night. Would you come and meet us? And I would go to a 13 floors of that. The, the elevator only goes to that floor in the middle of a, like a high rise and uh, and sit. And they tell me all kind of operations they want me to be part of. And most of them, I I was like, no, guys, I'm good in theater yeah it it works for us we want we want you to to be an actor that's like yeah i know but i'm, I'm not interested now yeah. in uh, i mean after uh, all don't don't actors make great spies and don't spies make great actors i guess i guess but uh i mostly rejected you you wanted to do real acting as opposed to uh exactly acting that could get you killed <laughs> You thought about medicine for two seconds, but then you ended up in a circus school for two years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my dad really wanted me to become a, a, a doctor. Of course. But while I was, you know, doing my uh, updating myself in physics and math, and which I never was good at, yeah. uh, I. I like it hard. I took a year off after the armies, like decided I'm going to just do whatever I want to do before I become a doctor and go for seven years of university and blah, blah, blah. And then all I wanted to do, well, all I was doing, suddenly I, I looked back and I was like, okay, so I'm doing tap dancing and magic tricks and uh, uh, juggling and everything. It's like, okay, I, I think something is getting clear and clear. And, and then I joined this school. And after two years, I ended up going, you know, uh, traveling in Europe. And I worked in for some time in the circus. And then I was like, okay, so now now let's go. And you ended up in Paris at the at the circus, the Pavel. Six quids, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was there for, I was doing some juggling. And I had this funny, crazy uh, number that looks like two little people fighting. And it's one suit that does that. And uh, but uh, after a while there, I was like, OK, so that I got that. That's fun. I, I can I, I can juggle and do somersault. But let's let's continue. And then I went to an acting school. And yeah, you eventually end up at, uh, at the Gashara Theater. Yeah. In yeah. Tel Aviv, the company was originally composed of Russian of, of immigrants from from the USSR. Yeah, it was 1989, and and the 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 wall fell, and a group of Russian uh, actors and a a director who passed away a year ago, who was my teacher and uh, and father figure in a way, and everything. He was Nissan uh, Nativ. 
Nisanati was my my acting teacher. This was uh, Eugene Evgeny Arie. Okay. Uh, and he founded this theater, and he was the, oh, gotcha, the gotcha. lead director in it. So they formed the theater, and somehow I got to uh, I got offered the lead in its first uh, uh, piece, uh, Rosencrantz and Ginst and Not Dead by Tom Stoppard. Cool. And I remember I was, I was, you know, after, it was just after acting school and I joined this little group theater ensemble and I told them, hey guys, you know, I'm not sure I'll be able to do the first show because this Russian theater came and they offered me the, a part in a Stoppard uh, play for, for, play. For, for, for for reference sake, I should point out that in, in the years that followed, uh, Yashar became huge. The London Times calls it one of the six best theater companies in the whole world. Yeah, yeah, no, it, so it, it's, it's a really this 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 it, you you were part of the the formative you know, moments of what yeah, the, I was one of the co-founders. The I was one of the co-founders of theater, but in that the, the little ensemble. Yeah. Uh, friends group that were doing theater when I told them about joining this theater they was like you are you're a coward you know instead of, of working with us and, and doing something that is like theater at its uh, core you're just going to these Russians who nothing is going to happen with them but you feel it's like easy and so you go there and blah. I, I remember this conversation and then eight months later and it wasn't easy because it took me about a week of rehearsals to realize these people, you know, they came from the Russian theater. They were big in in the Russian theater world, which was incredibly, uh, you know, much more uh, advanced than the Israeli theater at the time. And then, so I'm I'm studying this lead on on the play, and suddenly I realized they are so much better than me. Mm-hmm. I am so in a, such a level under them it, it took me a, quite a few months to just get uh adjusted and and become feel that i'm part of this thing and yeah and it became a huge success the managing director at gesher her name was lena Kreindlin, mm-hmm. and, and she said that uh your russian was terrible they they <laughs> laughed at me. They laughed at me because you know I'm, we're talking about. Well, it was 1990, and I came to Israel in, in 1972 when I was seven. So, so from Russia, <laughs> from Russia, Ukraine. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, and I didn't have. I didn't have. You know, I I had Russian, but it wasn't very good. And my mm. basically the accent was kind of crap. Uh. But. Then ten years in this Russian theater with with uh, with uh, you know being mostly speaking Russian throughout the day, uh, it got much better. But in the beginning, yeah, they made fun of me. For for Americans, it, it's the difference between uh, an authentic British accent, which can be very varied from from place to place to place. Mm-hmm. And Americans, you know, and how Americans view. Uh, <clears throat> Different accents. It, it's, accents, exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. When I try to to do a British accent, my both my daughters are like, "Dad, stop it, please. This sucks. Just please don't do it." Eventually, you find your way into feature films. Um, yeah, you uh, you end up working. You, you get you get cast by Steven Spielberg in Schindler's List. Yeah. But how you actually got the role you got is a little more complicated. Oh, yeah. There's a story there. So I'm, I'm in Gesha Theater. And at this point, we are one of the six best theaters in the world. We travel the world and perform in Rome, New York, uh, you know, Paris, blah, blah, blah. And, and then my – so I'm, I am – in theater, I'm I'm a, 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 a like a player in a big uh, theatrical kind of world, and suddenly I, I remember my agent calls me and she says, "So there's an they want you to audition for a part in a new movie, 
uh, Steven Spielberg, you know, the guy who did E.T., he, she tells me. And uh, he is he's doing a movie about the Holocaust. Uh, I don't know, something Sh 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 Schindler or something like this. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, well. You're in the movie. Yeah. And then she said, and I said, so when is the audition? It says tomorrow at like 10. It's like, well, no, I can't do 10. I have a dentist appointment and I kind of bailed on them already twice. So I can't make it because I am, you know, in the theater. I don't need this crap. And then and she ended up, you know, ending the conversation. It was like she, she put the phone down. It's like, I don't want to talk to you. And then at 10, I'm at the dentist and suddenly to myself, it's like, are you? dumb why why it's like you have it's it's five ten minutes walk from here that casting place just go there and i ditched the uh, dentist yet again and went to uh to audition did the audition and then got a, a call back and then got a part and uh it took another year between uh from that the audition uh period till they started shooting the movie uh, during which uh, the part was written out of uh, the script. And I was, okay, so I'm not going to do this movie. It's fine. I'm still in the theater. All is good. And then one day I'm getting a phone call from that agent. It's like, this is crazy. They've started shooting the movie already. I mean, it's like two months into shooting the film. They want you for a much bigger part. It's, uh, it's really important. And uh, they want you to fly like tomorrow and or the day after tomorrow and and i'm like what the, how do i uh first of all i need to tell my theater that i'm that i'll need to be away for two and a half months then i need to figure out with the army going back to the intelligence forces i'm signed when i join that unit that i can't go to any ex uh to any communist country at this time we were shooting in poland which was an ex communist country yeah yeah, so yeah. I had to somehow over i mean i i just went and i and i just hoped it was fine no one stopped me so that was okay then i went and 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 starting shooting and i was i was so curious to to figure out why what happened why suddenly out of the blue after two months of shooting they decided that they want me to do this much bigger part after what the hell happened and i asked one of the you know a uh, the, the the pas of spielberg's like whether he knows something about it and he's like yeah uh actually i do i remember what happened i was like we were sitting and the guy who went for this but who had the part an Israeli guy he was in the theater and he got into a car accident and Stephen liked him very much and said okay we'll build the thing around you so we'll give you two months of uh getting better and then we'll fly you in but then a week before he was supposed to fly in his doctor said you can't I mean you're not healed enough you can't get on the plane so they asked the casting uh, office in Israel to send them video tapes. I mean, we're talking VHS back then of the people who auditioned for his part. They sent it. So they're sitting in this room with uh, I mean, Spielberg, Kate Capshaw, his wife, a few more people casting uh, and all. And they are popping the VHS in and looking. Uh, but as VHSs go, there were auditions for different things in the beginning, and that was like towards the end of the VHS. So they just do fast forward, and no one is looking at it. Everyone is talking, but Kate Capshaw, who is who is just like she said, hey, yeah, 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 can you stop this? Because with the fast forward, she saw my face uh, with my Jewish nose and. I had these round glasses and curly hair and everything. It's like, what's up? And Stephen looked like her husband for sake. Like, yeah. It's like, Stephen, look at this face. And he's looking. He's like, yeah, I remember him because I, I did have a small part. So, yeah, let's take him. <laughs> and that was how my life changed because had it not been that, I wouldn't. Like, have like been Moses uh, plucked from the reeds. Exactly. Exactly. And I wouldn't have been sitting here in LA in Silver Lake. Uh, talking to you about my international career had not Kate Capshaw. It's a remarkable story of, of, of how, how much serendipity 
uh, and chance affects things that happen in this business and <laughs> careers. Did you, Mark, can I ask you a question? Did you ever meet uh, Bronco Lustig? Yeah, Bronco was, we were very friendly. Uh, Bronco, uh, I have, I actually have somewhere a tape of me, of a conversation with Broncos that someone took on set. But uh, he was the sweetest man. He was one of the producers of the movie. Yeah. He, uh, and he was originally from Serbia. So he yeah. was bringing trains with Serbian uh, people who were at the war at the time in Serbia who were uh, extras mm-hmm. in all sort of scenes uh, of, of the camps. I remember that very well, and all of the ads were Serbian. Yeah, he was he was very instrumental in that movie. Yeah, I, I met him many many years ago in the seventies in, uh-huh. in, in the then Yugoslavia. I was there scouting a movie with Dick Fleischer. Oh, and the oh. local producer was going to be Bronco, and uh, and I was the producer, and so I met with him and chatted with him, spent a long lot lot of time with him, and I kept on thinking to myself. You know, at your age, what what did you do in the war? And I never mm-hmm. felt like I could ask him. And so we never discussed it. The movie, uh-huh. the, the movie never happened. It fell apart. I go back, uh-huh. I go come back to New York and then to Los Angeles. And Bronco starts making his way to, to Los Angeles. We meet again in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. And he says to me, you know, he remembers vividly and, and, and fondly our conversations in Yugoslavia and 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 Yadran, you know, with with the company in Yugoslavia, and I and he said to me, you know, I I really enjoyed our conversations, and I said, yeah, I did too. I said, you know, I I needed I needed to ask you a question, then, and either I was too young or too frightened, or maybe both, <laughs> to ask you. But yeah. I really kept thinking in my mind, I wanted to ask you, what did you do during the war? Because you obviously were of age that had some meaning. And I never for a second, and he said to me, his answer was, he was Jewish. And yes. I, fell, I fell on the floor. I said to him, I didn't want to ask you because I figured you must have been a German or working for the Germans. No. <laughs> I never thought for it. And so he lifts up his shirt and he shows me the numbers. The number, yeah. And I, I just about fell on the floor. Well, from that moment on, we were like, you know, almost connected at the hip. I love the man. Oh, uh, such and a as great much time guy. as I could with him, and it was just you know it 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 just goes to show you. I mean, had I could had I said something to him all those years earlier, our relationship probably would have been very different from way way earlier. Correct. But Correct. he was uh, he was an incredible incredible producer. Yes, he incredible passed producer. away what like seven eight years ago. Uh, yeah. He, he, yeah. He was wonderful. Yeah, he was. He was. He was really good at what he did, and he was a, an incredibly nice man. Yeah, yeah. As good work does, your your work in Schindler's List got you more work. And eventually you ended up working with De Niro uh, in The Good Shepherd. You won the Silver Bear Award at the Berlin Film Festival for that. Yep. It took some time to uh, get cast in it. It's one of another project that took a very long time until it, it happened. And then so I had a meeting with him after I read for it, then they asked me to come and meet with him while he was filming Meet the Fockers in Los Angeles. So I, we sat in his trailer and talked about the uh, the part. And what was funny is that I, I kind of, well, there's a few stories about that. But one of them was that in the audition, the original audition, I kind of added because I'm playing a character that is being... Yeah. Severely drugged. There's a uh, interrogation. Your name. I told you my name. Tell I told me your you name. Hundred times. Because we're, we're name. not going anywhere. I don't want you to know that. We are not going anywhere today, tomorrow, next week, next you month. Know, he is your I'm not. Do you understand? I can't Aren't you right in front of you? Else. The same position. This is my name. What is your name? My name is Valentin Grigorich Milan. This is my name. Tell, tell me your name. I don't have a different name. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it, me. Tell it to me again. Tell, tell it to me again. Tell me your name. You can say it. We are going to be here a long time. Keep it up. 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 Keep it
fucking your name. Tell me your fucking name. Будет небо, пусть всегда будет папа. I remember assistant, uh, De Niro's assistant calling me and says, so uh, you sang this song in the audition. We want to keep that, but we don't want to get the rights for, I mean, it, we need the rights for the song that we don't have that. But Universal gave us another song. And so here's the song. And I call him back 20 minutes later. It's like, look, I mean, De Niro most probably knows as an actor, you, if you choose something, there's a reason. And I chose this thing, this song for a reason, because it says it does something to me emotionally. The other one doesn't. Uh, so just if you can uh, convey that to Bob. And literally three minutes later, I get a phone call from this guy. He says, Bob said, just stay with this song. He'll do whatever needed for you to have that because that's the most important thing. And then uh, it, it, it wasn't incredible. The whole shooting process was incredible. He was so very much uh, tuned to what you, uh, me as an actor, what I needed, including mm -hmm. at a certain, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but including in a certain stage, just stopping the, uh, a, there was a scene that was supposed to be done and then they canceled it because of problems, financial problems and time problems and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I called him and I said, again, look, it's that scene is really important to me uh, for the last uh, very significant scene that I have. Uh, so I don't know, of course, you're the director, you can do, you should do whatever, but I'm just wanted to let you know. And he stopped uh, everyone that were getting ready for the new scene and all the light and, and, and the set and everything. And he said, no, we're going to actually do that scene because, because it's important. And that, which cost them, I'm sure, a lot of money, but that's, that, that, that was him. He is really focused on what you as an actor need. And thank God the result was really good because because how he he was he was so attentive and uh, and went for what he, he trusted he, you he said yeah we were standing in the middle of the set me him and the dp who was if i mean hindsight i i heard he was the producer's man and he was uh representing the producer's uh, position and he was like we don't need it we don't need it and it was me and him for 15 minutes talking about it. And then De Niro is like, who was silent, just looking at it. And it's like, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to go with the actor. And everything stopped and they went back and uh, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful, uh, and it actually it seems like I'm going to do, uh, that's a bit of a, I didn't sign any NDA, but I think, I might do a Netflix show with De Niro in the next couple of months. Oh, cool. uh, we are just in negotiations for that. So oh, cool, that would cool. be really uh, exciting to get back. We haven't seen each other for, what, 15 years, 14 years, something like that. You know, having experienced the joys of putting the team back together again, it's, uh, it's good to put the team back together again. Yeah, no, that's, that's really exciting. Uh, among the, I think the, the, the first piece that I saw where something went, wow, hey, there's a guy named Mark Ivanir and he can act, was uh, you, you, you played the part of the human resources manager in a film of that title, The Human Resources Manager. And it's this quirky little, it's an Israeli movie, isn't it? It's an Israeli movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's just this odd little thing that, that, that goes about wherever it goes about, but it's, it's, it's a, really delightful little movie and, and you're terrific in it thank you thank you it was uh it's based on a, on a novel by a famous israeli novelist uh, out of bet yoshua and uh it's a story of of a human resources manager who uh in a bakery and then there's uh a terror a terror attack and a uh, foreign worker from Romania who works, who used to work at the bakery, 
uh, dies at the, in the terror attack. And then this human resources manager is launching into this uh, path of trying to figure out what happened to this woman uh, and try and bring her back to uh, to bury her in Romania with her family. He goes flies to Romania, meets with her son and ex-husband, and it's like a whole road movie. But with a body, unusual. with a body, with a body, uh, yeah. very unusual, very quirky, as you say, uh, sad and funny. It's, it, it was a, it was a nice movie. It won the Locarno Film Festival. Uh, I, in hindsight, I, I, I really enjoyed it, and I. From time to time, I just like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch it again because it's heartwarming and nice. It is. It, it's a it's a delightful movie, and if people should 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 catch up with it. You were the the fourth lead in the Late Quartet, opposite uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Christopher Walken, and, and Catherine Keener. That's a another terrific piece of work. That that was that was an, an incredible, really incredible experience because. Sitting with these three people was, it was like going to school again, to acting school. I mean, that was, what, uh, 10 years ago? And that was about 20 years uh, after my last acting school experience. But but it was really, really sitting with masters and, and seeing them at work and just, just... Wow, I, how, how, I, I need to, I need to remember that and that and that. Like in particular, is it's just the way all of them were so open. There was so much improvisation happening there, uh, and and uh, listening. And uh, I mean, Phil was was just an amazing guy. I I I feel so you know bad about, of course, him going away. He was on the list of my best. If you if you put five best actors ever, he would be on that list. Mm. And so I'm I feel kind of blessed being part of that event and and working with these people. I mean, and here's here's a funny story about them. So there's we had a one week rehearsal period uh, on in which we would come in the morning and just do every scene and and go through the scenes and rehearse them and. So we're sitting one morning and said, Phil and, and Catherine, who were friends uh, besides the, the, the shooting they, from before, they have like something is happening there between them. They're laughing and they're whispering to each other. And like an hour and a half into the thing, there's a break. And uh, we, would, we would go and smoke a cigarette outside after uh, like in between uh, rehearsals. So all three of us step outside and smoke cigarette and i asked them so guys what's what's going on what's the little thing that happening between you and phil is saying so look i mean we were just talking about how everyone thinks we are it's like i'm an oscar winning actor and Catherine was nominated and we did this and that and then and that and how insecure we are and how little we know and what you know we we how stupid and not adequate we feel and that you know so the gap between that and what we are having when people are looking at us and talking that that was kind of funny and we were kidding about that and to me it was so I are opening that this guy who was nominated for three Oscars in the past four years and won one and Catherine who were in, in these and that's what they feel. So, wow. So we are in the middle of Manhattan and we are crossing the street from, I don't know, I think we were shooting at the mat and the trailers were on the other side of the street. So we are crossing the street and there's uh, in the middle, there's a little, uh uh like pathway and we're standing all three of us we're waiting for the cars to pass and a taxi stops and i'm standing in between phil and christopher walken and the taxi stops i i did many years ago i did two movies called undisputed undisputed two undisputed three which is 
fight movies, UFC, how is it called? Uh, I, I don't even know, but like wrestling and, and, and they became, both these movies are like in the top martial arts movies ever because of how they are. And I, I play a major part in that, but you know, people, when I go to Thailand, I know when people recognize me in South Africa, it's like, it's still straight to video type of audience. So we stand there, Phil, uh, walking and I, and a taxi pulls over and this guy looks at me, points the finger at me and it's like, Gaga, that's the part, that's my part. You are amazing. You are an amazing actor. And he drives away. And both of them are like, what <laughs> the hell has happened? I was like, he didn't know who they were. It was me, Gaga. And, and I'm like, yeah, it's uh, undisputed. You should watch it or not. Your, your work in TV, uh, you've done tons and tons, both here in Europe in Israel, and we'll we'll get to Israeli TV in a second. It, it's it's having a kind of golden age, it seems. Yeah. Here, you uh, a ton of people know know you from your work in Homeland as as Ivan. Harry Matheson's name in that kill yeah. box. Conversation like this might lead to the SVR. Might even lead to me. It will never, ever lead to you. Okay. As I told you, my problem. You better be fucking right. You better fucking relax, Alison. It started with, uh, they asked me to audition for a couple of parts. One was Israeli that wasn't very good. But then there was this Russian part that I really liked, but I didn't know where it's going to go. I mean, it was supposed to be one or two episodes. And then, so I booked the part. They flew me to Berlin to shoot. And uh, I um, I was talking to Alex, who is one of the producers of Homeland, uh, who called me while I'm in Berlin and started, you know, explaining to me about this spy guy who is uh, uh, <sighs> tried to give me some background for this guy. And, I, and like at a certain stage, and Alex keeps when we bump into each other, he keeps telling the story. It's like. I am, I'm telling him, yeah, I, I have some experience. And I told him about my experience in the Israeli, you know, intelligence forces. And then he's like, oh, oh you know what? Okay, so just like do your thing. I'm not going to tell you anything and it's fine. Okay, so Marcus had to relocate because of a noisy neighbor. So we're, we're going to pick up the, the uh, this homeland story from uh, where, where, where were you before you were so rudely interrupted? So I, w I was saying that, that my... Uh, the way I work is I I come up with suggestions and I just try to suggest them. So which I kind of pay the price for them throughout the years. Spielberg at a certain stage, going back to Schindler's List, didn't want to talk to me when I was just like pushing an idea and he really you know, disliked that. Uh, thank God he hired me for other projects later. But at the time, I thought that's that's the end of my career, and uh, and other places. So in Homeland, it was the same thing. I came up with a few ideas of uh, what my spy guy should do and how he should operate, and it re resonated with with the producers and the directors. And then uh, it was uh, kind of implemented in what I was doing, and the part kept growing and that they brought me back so it's one of the the arc that i had there i love it it was it was a beautiful uh, project to be to be part of mm. it was a great season it was a good season mm. it was nominated for the Emmy. it was really nice whole point is that body he have no connection to our family you follow him around and be personal photographer that's connection why would you do this you kill my brother? Okay, you need to let that oh go. Oh my God, okay. no one cares. It's so boring. Every day we kill my brother. Let me kill him. The tomb? Ruslan here was last one born. So he got a little overcooked. 
Rustling, right? It's rustling? Yeah, you know what, buddy? You are in America now, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was a part I auditioned for, and I didn't I didn't know who it, it's going to be with and everything. But I uh, again, this this is something that I had an idea of what to do. I like I was bursting into all sort of you know Russian in the middle and singing songs and doing stupid things because it was you know it it seemed like I I can uh the way it was written that the, the the sides that I got and so I went into the room and Bill Hader was in the room and I started I remember I started working there and then I just like got into uh I started improvising and and doing stupid shit and and then I see Bill starting laughing and he's like it didn't stop and i was so i remember getting into the car calling my wife maya from the car and said this is this was so beautiful it's just like i mean that that fee because i haven't done theater for a long time and that was like in the theater you are in the room and something that you do the reaction is so immediate Im immediate we were shooting this scene in which i go to a theater uh because i want to kill uh uh, Barry's girlfriend's character or something and uh, so the scene is I'm in that we were shooting in Silver Lake in this theater and the director says okay so Mark so you'll go from the top of the theater down to the stage you stay, stay by the stage stage uh, look up we'll catch your uh, gaze and then we'll moving on to a different scene we're doing that i'm going down standing there looking and so okay, cut let's move on it's like yeah uh, w one moment it's like do you think can, can i have another uh take and he's like yeah sure because it's you know they, they just go with what you say it's like because i'm thinking this is a crazy uh killer uh who who is his his hobby is basically uh you know, uh, slashing people's throats, but he is in the theater. He is by a stage, and it's it's a universal thing that you have this. You you might have an audience. You might have. I mean, you are on a stage, so action. And I ask the character. I go down, and then I climb on the stage and just look into this empty uh, hole with with seats. Uh, Cut. Let's move on. It's like, can I have another take, please? <laughs> and now in my head, I know that this crazy dude, crazy uh, murderer guy will try to perform because I'm on a stage. And because I have, it's like not, not real, but still I have an audience. Yeah. What if he performed? In my head, I run all of the scenarios. What can I do? It should be a song. It should be a song I know. In Russian, I find something from the 70s that I knew uh, by heart, and it's about hockey players. And uh, the, of course the, it is. The, yeah, the main thing is like a, a coward doesn't play hockey. That's the song. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. Action, I go down, go up the stage, stand there, and improvise. And they let me improvise for about two minutes. I'm doing this improvisation of someone who gets there and 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 ends up singing the song. Cut. Everything is done, and everyone is clapping. There's like uh, applause after the the thing. It's like, oh well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Two weeks later, Bill, uh, I come for another shoot shooting day, and Bill says, you know that thing that you did. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, in the series up until now, it's like yeah, but it's not going to get into the into the series. I mean, right? I mean, this is is a well. You don't know. You'll you'll never know. Four months later, I'm in Cape Town shooting the Red Sea Diving Resort uh, that we talked about before, and they want me to do ADR from Cape Town for Barry. I'm doing ADR, talking to uh, the producer, and I was like, so what? What happened to that little scene where I go on the stage and do all of that? uh singing and he said yeah you know what i'm not sure it's gonna get in because apparently there's no uh 
rights for the song. That's that's it's a problem. I was like, oh well, I didn't realize in the seventies that they had rights in the USSR. But yeah, whatever. I come back from Cape Town. They invite me and everyone else in the cast to Sony for a screening of uh, the season of Barry. And I walk into the the, the movie theater. And Bill from 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 afar sees me. It's like, hey, hey, Mark, you need to hear this. He says, three weeks ago, Sony put a guy on a plane who fl- flew from LA to Moscow, took a train from Moscow to some godforsaken place, took a boat to this island on which the 93-year-old composer of the song is to sign him on, you know, off the rights for the song, only for the seven seconds of what they put in the in the series. And that's how it made it there. And that's like, okay, thank you. And it's in the, oh my it's in the God. Yeah. You are one expensive actor, my friend. I am. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am. <laughs> oh my God! What a that is a very funny story. You were big in Israel. That that's way better than being big in Japan. Uh, <laughs> I uh, guess never it, been big in Japan. It, it's a, it's amazing the uh, the golden age that that uh, I'm, that Israeli television is is experiencing. Uh, Homeland was based on an Israeli show. Yeah. Yeah, that that's how I think. Well, before there, the, there was uh, in treatment. I think that was the first one that kind of broke into uh, American uh, uh, audience, and HBO picked it up, and that, yeah. that and uh, Netflix, of course. Well, uh, Stizzle, uh, Stizzle is popular Stizzle. in places you would never expect a show like that yeah. to be popular. I mean, Stizzle, and then Fauda Stizzle. is another sorry, one. Sorry, sorry. No, no, it's fine. And then Fauda. Is is another uh, yeah. huge hit, and you were uh, supposed to be, you were supposed to be in Fauda, or or I was supposed to to be in this the last fourth season, but mm-hmm. then uh, last moment uh, the Omicron started, and then a three day shoot in Israel turned into a five week yeah. stay there because I... you had to quarantine for a week, and then like, you can go back and forth, and 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 I was like uh, on the day I was supposed to fly into israel i called him and said you guys you have that week of quarantine uh that i was supposed to stay in to get a new actor and get him into the part because i i, I just can't do that uh unfortunately but hopefully i don't know there's more hopefully there's going to be more seasons fourth season was they say the best so they probably will have another one and then you never it was know. A, a strange ending to 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 the to season four with, with the whole group looking like they, they could be Somewhere between life and death, all, all holding hands there on, on the ground. Okay. Literal, literal cliffhanger. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not, yeah, but not, not that we're fans of the show or anything. Yeah, but to your point, Alan, about about uh, the, the popularity of Israeli television, hmm. um, and this is something I'm really interested in talking to you about, Mark, is, yeah. um, you know, Fout is one of my favorite shows. I, I mm-hmm. just love that show. And I love it, not for the obvious reasons, I don't think. I love it because... I see Israelis and Palestinians in front of the camera and behind the camera working together, talking about their conflict. Yeah, yeah. Which if you would have said, if you would have come to me and said, you know, that's the idea for my show, what do you think? I would have said, you know, you're going to start a war. I mean, <laughs> how, how are we going to do that show? And yet yeah. it's very successful. It's very emotional. And it's, it's, it's one of my favorite shows. I look at that show. And I think of all the other things that are happening in Israel right now in terms of television. And I know a lot of it is because of streaming, because the streamers are interested in international product and they're interested in in international uh, subscribership. And so, you know, I've had conversations with them where they say, well, can you bring us something that's appropriate for the Middle East or or, or for South America? And so they're they're sort of helping it along. Um, But do you think that's really what's caused it or do you think it's something else and and this has just helped it along you know i i think well israel is in an interesting place i mean first of all it's uh we have there's a lot of exposure to 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 american or british tv uh more than in other places because there, there was for 
many years there wasn't other options. So a lot of people are watching both European and, and American TV, and they have a lot of background. Uh, there's a lot of talent because, the, I mean, it's it's a special place, interesting place, the way uh, you, you are brought up. There's so many challenges and so many diverse uh, uh, ideas that, that you are, uh, you know, open to. Uh, so little by little, people started getting writing things and then uh, and and uh, i think the american industry picked up on it and so, and you have the i mean part of why to me fauda is such an interesting show because it's reality it's israeli reality yeah but it's about this unit of uh undercover uh israeli commandos who, who go undercover as Arabs and they go into terror groups and, and into the Kasbahs of, uh, you know, Gaza or uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, and they act as Arabs and they are trying to either prevent uh, terror acts or uh, find out information, all of that. But the crazy thing about it, and again, that's very much Israel. You can sit in your house in, like, Israel, uh, in your uh, little uh, private house with a yard and talk, and, ki- and your kids are running around and playing, and then you get a phone call. And basically, and that's, that's the why, because everything is so close, you, they, they tell you you need to come. There's an operation you get into your car and basically 20 minutes later, you are in a uh, war zone. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's how fast this, this turns from one way of living to another. And I think what they do very well is not show, not show it very one-dimensionally. But you see both sides. There's not none of the sides is good or bad. It's just the reality of of what's happening in Israel. So I think that's kind of that that gives you a way of of seeing things in a different way, and that's part of Israel because it's such a, a special and unusual place. Uh, Shtiso is is again Alan yeah. another uh, example of the same thing of this this world yeah. within. A, a world that is such a reclused but interesting and fascinating uh, situation, and that's that's part of what Israel is. So that combined with uh, them, you know, a lot of Israelis go and 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 study abroad and study in the states and get into the industry and come back and bring all of that. Uh, that with the streaming being looking for 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 stuff that kind of brought about this this uh uh flourishing of israeli uh tv yeah and especially with fauda you know with with in front of the camera and behind the camera them using both palestinians and israelis is Mm a sort of almost a first in terms of my understanding of how that could work or how it's how it's actually working yeah that's that's terribly fascinating you know while i watch the show and I'm, i'm thinking What's behind the camera? Who's behind the camera? And what what's their relationship to each other? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's it's really and 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 it's very emotional. I mean, I find that the, the characters it is. are really drawn. And it that is. It's, you're very yeah. you're brought into it in a very emotional way. And it and it has somehow it has the same um like Homeland always would start a bit slower with everything kind of brewing and you are little by little you try to figure out what's going on what's the the operation what what, where the problem is and then uh, come episode four five it just the 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 pace picks up and and then by the end you are just like i want to watch this because i'm so in into that the same with fauda it takes you it just draws you in for three four episodes and then it's non-stop action but it's not just action for the sake of action it's action with you are emotionally connected to the parts yeah. as well it's, it's a really good show yeah i agree
you've you've worked all over the world in in tv and film it, it's funny every every we, gil and i have bumped into the fact on one occasion where a a film production culture is different from country to country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we bumped into that a couple of times yeah um are there places where, where you feel like the, the film production culture is better versus worse uh you know it's it, you have it's on one hand and i do work like in, in in a lot of places and on one hand so much is 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 the same i mean people dress the same way talk the same way uh look the same way it's it, it's it's really funny to see you and you, you go from la to Cape Town, to Berlin, uh, or Jerusalem, and you see the same people in the same places. But each place has its own, I mean, Israel being Israel, you go to makeup, and, uh, and they talk to you, and then you do your scene, and then there's a touch-up, and the makeup artist would which will never happen at the stage was like, you know, in that scene, you could have done this and this, or, uh, you know, they, 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 they will have comments and they will tell you that. Of course they uh, will. And this is so, so Israel, but yeah, that, that, that's it. Uh, other places, uh, you know, I was, I was surprised. Let's say I was shooting something in London a year ago. And actually I was surprised by, how disorganized one production was, then they, and it. I, I don't say that's that's the British way. Maybe that was the the, the same. I mean that particular production, but uh, but the, the, there was something. I mean in England, it wasn't that no, the, it wasn't a disorganized uh, uh, thing, but it was that uh, almost a caste system of how how things are being done so so the director is a bit more distant and and unapproachable than other places the last time you you worked in in england in london what was your craft services table like uh not great <laughs> oh, but talking about craft service that's what i wanted to yeah talk that's about. our experience so, no exactly but but i'm in paris and i'm shooting the series and uh we're breaking for lunch for the first time and we're sitting by the tables and each table has a bottle of wine. I mean, it's 1 p.m. and there's a bottle of wine and wine glasses. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I remember I took a photo and put it on Instagram. I was like, yeah. This different, is culture. different culture. This is lunch. Yeah. Uh, but it's funny how, how different it is. Mark, we could go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, you have a Sunday afternoon and you have a family and a life and uh, I, 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 I can't thank you enough for, 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 for sitting and, and chatting with us uh, it was my pleasure about crap <laughs> thank you thank Mark you. Really inter very interesting very very interesting I think, our, I think a lot of our, 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 our people that watch our show will really enjoy this because it's so it's, it's so from a different perspective on one level and yet from a very very understandable perspective for them on another so thank you so much for that thank you guys it was fun and uh hey let's let's do it again let's do it again uh we'll see you next time everybody the how not to make a movie podcast is executive produced by me alan katz by gil adler and by jason stein our art